if you want to take one and or look at one to see what you can put in the box or not, they're up here. And um, I have some flyers for the trunk or treat. So if anybody wants to grab a couple of those and pass them out to neighbors or friends or grandkids or something, you're welcome to grab some of those. And then also uh, there's a baby shower here on November 6th. Um, join us for a baby shower honoring Miles Talbert. Um, and remind me the connection, who uh, the Wolfs, the Wolf family, does that sound familiar? Uh, who is that? So you all probably know who this is and I don't. Uh, but um, if you'd like to take an invitation to that as a reminder, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. <clears throat> okay, and then does anybody need our stu student sheet for this one? We're starting, uh, we well, probably y'all do. I don't think I passed out the second one last week, did I? So let's do that. Anybody have any prayer concerns you'd like for us to particularly lift up tonight? else I want to keep remembering uh, the Palmer family and uh, Leslie King and Lou Ann Moore and Jeff Boggs yeah McNeil family. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, too young. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Well, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And we thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together and and just, just be church family together and just kind of enjoy each other's company and offer each other encouragement and support and study your word together. And we, we thank you that uh, your promises where two or more are gathered, you're with us. And so help us to, in faith, know and believe and feel and experience that you are indeed with us and that you are right here with us. And so as we spend this time together, we, we just pray that you would teach us and that you would encourage us, that, that you would build our faith in you and build our understanding of you, reveal yourself to us in, in special new ways. And Lord, we do uplift all these on our prayer concerns, but especially we want to lift up the, the gentleman in the accident. We thank you that uh, he's, he's starting to have some improvement, we, but we do pray for recovery and for healing and peace and comfort and provision for their family. And we pray for the McNeil family in their time of loss that you would bring comfort. And, and we pray that during this time of loss that it would be a time that uh, people in that family or, or people that surround uh, this situation would, would be, uh, that, that their mortality would just be on their minds and that would draw them maybe to uh, being receptive to your gospel. I, I pray that during this time that they would 
um, that they would be able to hear the gospel in some way, some format, uh, that they would understand and maybe their hearts would be tender and open to receiving you. Uh, we pray for comfort for those who uh, are dealing with that, that time of loss. Uh, we uplift Jeff Boggs, continue praying for healing and recovery and strength and comfort for him and his family. And uh, Luann Moore, as she continues to recover, and uh, Mike Palmer's family, and uh, we just pray for uh, for healing in that situation, for uh, for you to work in a in a mighty, powerful, life changing way uh, in that situation, and for comfort and and for hope as well for them, and we pray for Leslie King and for healing uh, in her situation. And we pray for our church, uh, just pray for unity in our church and, and a growing love and appreciation for each other, um, that, that we would uh, just grow close, as we grow closer to you, that we would also be growing closer to each other and, and really um, bonding together and encouraging each other and supporting each other together every, every time we're together and even when we're not formally meeting, that, that we would have those close connections that... Uh, that support one another. Uh, we pray for our trunk or treat on Saturday. We, we just pray, Lord, for a, well, uh, selfishly we're praying for, a, for the rain to hold off, but, e but even if it rains, Lord, we trust you to help things to work out. But um, we pray for a good turnout, that people would see our signs and, and hear the word um, and that, that families would come out and bring their kids out to, to be a part of this. And so... Um, we pray for our folks, that you would prepare our hearts for the interactions that we're going to have with people in our community, that, that all of us would just be um, good witnesses for you and, and the hospitality that we show and the care and the love that we show and the, uh, the time that, that we have together with people in our community. May, may we be good witnesses for you. We know that, that the gospel has the potential of being heard if they'll turn on their radios as they're going through and lining up. And so we, we pray, Lord, that uh, somebody uh, who is listening will, will hear the gospel and, and their hearts will be um, quickened to accept you and to turn to you. Or, or those that know you would be drawn even closer to you. And so may it be a time where, where your name is lifted high and that, that you are offered and, and, and that gift of salvation that, that you will extend to us. And we pray for our time together tonight. Thank you for, for being here with us. Speak clearly to our hearts and our minds as we spend this time together. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. So we're going to continue in our uh, doctrine of called Foundations, doctrinal study, looking at 11 major doctrines. We've already covered one. Uh, we've looked at the doctrine of the Bible. Uh, God's perfect guidebook for living. I, I encourage you to kind of have that phrase kind of going through your mind sometimes, and, and uh, maybe it'll just come out naturally in conversation uh, sometime when you're talking to your family or friends. So have an opportunity to share your confidence in the Bible as God's Word, and it's our perfect guidebook for living. Uh, the whole point of this is so that we can live our lives uh, with a biblical worldview and know what the Bible teaches on some very important issues that surround our lives. And so that's, that's why we're doing this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about the doctrine of God, um, the Christian doctrine of the person of God. Uh, we've already learned that God is real. Uh, we know he exists because we see uh, God's creativity in what he's made. Uh, we know he's real because we see God's thumbprint on human history. Uh, we know God is real because we see God's actions in our own lives. And God is revealed. He reveals himself to us through his creation. He reveals himself to us through his word. And most importantly, he reveals himself to us through his son, Jesus, who became a person like us to, to teach us about God, to help us to better understand who God is and, and God's character and such. And so tonight, we're going to start talking about uh, how God is relational. And so our life change objectives uh, have been to gain a deeper sense uh, of how God's love for us is as a father, and then to act on that somehow of, of, in that relational sense. 
um, the truths that we're trying to remember about God. God is bigger and better and closer than I can imagine. So that's another phrase that hopefully we'll kind of mull over in our minds over and over and that it'll just kind of flow out naturally. God is bigger and better and closer than I can imagine. Uh, Therefore, the most important thing about me is what I believe about God. Therefore, when I see how great God is, it makes everything else look small. Those are the three truths that are kind of, we're trying to memorize as we go through this doctrine of God. So understanding who Jesus shows God to be is more critical to us than even a trip to the emergency room. Uh, If your belief about God is wrong, then even the more devout you are, the more lost you are. Uh, There's plenty of of false religions or false sects or cults out there that that claim that they have the the true knowledge and understanding of God, and yet they're false. And so those people that fall under those systems might be the most devout people you'll ever meet. But if they have a wrong understanding of who God is, then they can be as devout as they want to be and they're still wrong and they're still lost and they're not, they don't have that uh, personal relationship with him if they don't have an accurate understanding of who he is and the way that he's revealed himself to us. And uh, some of these others, like Islam, uh, would tell you that uh, their understanding of God is the only understanding and they're wrong. They've had a complete misunderstanding of who God is and God's character. Uh, Others, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, have a completely erroneous understanding of God. Uh, Mormons have a completely wrong understanding of God. And so you can be devout all you want, but it's got to start with us knowing who God is as he's revealed himself to us. And so thankfully, the Bible helps us to understand that, and Jesus has helped us to understand that. So Gallup surveys consistently show that most, and in fact, like in the 90s percent of Americans believe that God is real. They might not know much more than that, but believe that God in some way is real. And so for most people, whether God exists is not the issue. The question is, what kind of God is he? And What does Jesus reveal to us about God? And so the number one thing we want to understand that Jesus reveals to us about God is that God is relational. Uh, In a world where people see God as unapproachable and distant, the truth is that God is relational. And I can't think of any story, even in the Bible, uh, that, that shows us this truth any better than the parable of the prodigal son. And you all are familiar with the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, but um, and so because we're so familiar with it, sometimes uh, we, don't, we don't listen fully to it when we hear it. Uh, we think we know it all. And so let's, uh, let's look at, a, at the, the parable of the prodigal daughter, uh, which, came, which Philip Yancey uh, tells this story. It's more of a kind of a, a contemporary version of that parable. So he writes, A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just north of Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, and the short length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she seethes inside. I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. And that night, she acts on a plan she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. She runs away. Because newspapers in Traverse City report in lurid detail about the gangs, the drugs, and the violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes her parents will not look for her there. They might look in California or Florida, but not Detroit. On her second day in Detroit, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. 
The good life continues for a year. The man with the big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. The man with the big car uh, teaches her some things that we don't think are appropriate, obviously. Uh, But since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks at home, but their lives now seem so boring and provincial, she can hardly believe she grew up there. After a year, the first sallow signs of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days, we can't mess around, he growls, and before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside big department stores. Sleeping is the wrong word. A teenage girl in downtown Detroit at night can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes. Her cough worsens. One night, as she lies awake listening for footsteps, everything about her life suddenly looks different to her. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl, lost in a cold and frightening city. Something jolts a memory, and a single um, image fills her mind of May and Traverse City, when a million cherry trees blossom at once, with her golden retriever dashing through the rows of blossoming trees, chasing a tennis ball. God, why did I leave? She says to herself, and pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She's sobbing, and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. She calls home three times, but only gets the answering machine. The first two times, she hangs up without leaving a message. But the third time, she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for the bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. And during that time, uh, she... um, Where am I at? During that time, she realizes the flaws of her plan. What if her parents are out of of town and missed the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them? And even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. She should have given them some time to overcome the shock. On the bus, her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech she's preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing, the driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks. That's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide the course of her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror smooths her hair, and licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice, if her parents are even there. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepares her for what she sees. There in the bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and great-grandmother to boot. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers. And taped across the wall of the terminal is a computer-generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd of well-wishers steps her dad. She stares out through the tears in her eyes and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry, I know, but he interrupts her. Hush, child, we've got no time for that. You'll be late for the party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. Isn't that a a precious story? That's the way God loves you. 
In the parable of the prodigal son, the father sees his son in the distance and literally runs to him, hugs him, and restores him to his place in the family. Now, what a beautiful picture. Uh, Unfortunately, the picture in this parable of a father running to a struggling child is very different from the image that many of us have about God. Now, let's look at some popular ideas about God and compare them to the truth about God as we learn in the scriptures. Number one, the popular idea is that God is distant. The truth is that God is near. Now, we read in Psalm 139, 7 to 12, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light that become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And then we read in James 4, 8, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. God is awesomely near to all of us. God's presence is not beyond the farthest star, He is as near as our next heartbeat. He doesn't just watch us. He's with us. And now we might feel like God is distant from us at times. Even as believers, we go through those spells uh, spells in life where we feel like God is far away. But that doesn't change the fact of reality that he is actually near. David asked, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? God is near us, whether we're thinking of him or not. Isn't that good news? It's not just because we're conscious of him or not. His presence is near us. And so we need to have that in faith that he is always near us. Because his presence is everywhere. Now that's why James is able to give us this promise. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Uh, Though God uh, in his greatness is above and beyond uh, the created universe, he is at the same time right here with us, intimately involved in his creation. Our God is an awesome God and he is near. So the misperception is that God is distant. The truth is that God is near. Another popular idea is that God just passively watches our actions from afar. The truth is that God is intimately involved in every detail of our lives. Now listen to Matthew 6, 25 to 30. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Then in Luke 12, 6 and 7, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Amen. Hallelujah. That God considers us worth more than that and wants to take care of us. Jesus tells us in these passages 
that God is interested in the details of our lives, like what we eat and drink and wear, how we dress, those kind of things, um, how we spend the hours of our days. In Luke 12, he amazes us with the statement that God even knows the number of hairs on our head, uh, that he knows every last small intimate detail uh, about each one of us. So just because the details of life don't always work out as we want them to, doesn't mean that God doesn't care about those details. He absolutely does. Now, many people think that they should save their times of talking to God for the big stuff. Only bother him when you got a big problem that needs to be uh, answered. Uh, but if we do that, then uh, sometimes uh, when we get lost in the own details of our lives, we will waste so much time that we could be interacting with God. Uh, he wants to talk to us and, and be involved in the small detailed decisions of our lives as well. Uh, we don't want to miss out uh, on those opportunities to talk to him and to, to share with them and to get his input uh, when the vast majority of our lives are the little things and the details of our lives. And so uh, just look at the intricate design in a tiny flower and you'll see that God cares about the details. Just look at any part of his creation, really, and you can see how much he cares about the details. Look at the intricacies of our own human bodies, of how every little piece works, works right and, and works together, and how we thought of all the things that need to be involved for our own human bodies to work together. <clears throat> so God is interested in the details. Um, is that 7.30? Okay, let me go through one more and then we'll cut off so that folks can meet for choir. A, a third popular idea is that God is anxiously waiting to judge those who do wrong. Uh, and you probably, maybe sometimes we, we have that misperception ourselves, but definitely people out in the world that don't have a relationship with Jesus have that perception that God is a, a judgmental God who wants to punish people or who, who doesn't like people. And so that's the misperception. But the truth is that God is a loving God who wants to forgive our sins, wants to forgive those who ask him. Uh, we read in John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He came to save us from our own condemnation that, that we already brought on ourselves uh, because of our sin. He came to save us from that. Uh, many people picture God up in heaven with his finger on a button labeled, Zap them now just waiting to zap everybody that, that does something wrong. Uh, but we know that's not true. None of us would be here, right? Uh, there wouldn't be anybody left that hadn't been zapped if God uh, is waiting to zap everybody. Um, the fact that God hasn't judged us for our sin uh, is not because he hasn't noticed it or because he's ignoring it or because he doesn't care. He sees everything, and our sin breaks his heart. Uh, but it's because he is patiently waiting for you to ask him to forgive you uh, and, and for those who are lost to, to come to him in salvation, to be forgiven once and for all of their sin. Uh, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So when somebody says, I can't believe in a God who would callously allow children to suffer or allow rapes to occur, you can say with them, I don't believe in that kind of God either. I believe in a God who more than you and me cares about our hurts over the sinful things we do to each other. It breaks his heart too. I believe in a God who will one day stop evil in its tracks by shutting down this world and taking us to live with him 
in a perfect place called heaven. The only reason he hasn't already done it is because he's waiting for more people to trust in him so that they can spend eternity with him too. So in order to give more people the opportunity to come to know him, he's willing to endure more hurt and pain than we can imagine over the evil that we do to ourselves and to each other. Because he, he's trying to give more people time to understand and hear the gospel and to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That should put a fire under us too, shouldn't it? Uh, that, that we too should want that and um, try to get the word out of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So let, let's cut it off there tonight. I have one more of those that I want to mention and then we'll kind of move from there next week. But the, the big theme for tonight is that God is relational. God is relational. So any thoughts or comments or anything you want to share before we go? Okay. Remember our trick or treat on Saturday. Uh, if you're going to park a car here, and even if you haven't, if you already, if you hadn't already decided that you're going to do that, uh, let me encourage you to prayerfully consider doing that. We would love to fill our whole parking lot with folks passing out candy, uh, so that um, the folks that come through here will just be wowed at our participation. Um, but we we have a good turnout. If we have 12 cars already, and uh, that's a, that's a good turnout. So if we have all of that, I'll be I'll be pleased. Uh, but um, Still want to encourage anybody that hadn't thought of doing it yet to come out and join us for that. And so um, let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a relational God. And that you're not just some uh, creator God who made things and then went away and, and just sat back and let things uh, go on their own. Uh, but no, you, you're intimately involved in your creation. You're intimately involved in our lives. And Lord, we thank you that, uh, that you are not distant. Uh, we thank you that, that you are not just judging. That, well, we know that someday you will be the ultimate judge, but that you are very patient and merciful and forgiving in the meantime. And so may that put a fire under us, uh, to, um, to share the word, to, to spread the good news of the gospel of, uh, so that more and more and more people uh, can, can be forgiven of their sin as they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Uh, help us to have, Lord, we pray that that very thing will happen this weekend as a result of our, our trunk or treat, uh, that somebody uh, would hear the gospel and that you would uh, both convict their hearts and um, invite their, their souls to embrace the truth of who you are and what you've done and that they would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that's, that's our prayer for this. And, and as well as that, that, that you would just help us to, to build a, a deeper connection with people in our community, that, that we could build uh, relationships with people that, uh, that hopefully might bear fruit someday in, in letting us... Um, share your word and share the gospel and show support and encouragement and love for these people that we meet or these people that we know that, that uh, we see again. And so that, that's our prayer, Lord, that, that you would be glorified through this and that people would come to, to be closer to you and receive you through this. So we thank you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great night and a great rest of the week, and we will see you soon and very soon, hopefully Saturday and or Sunday, if not before. And God bless.